Hi, everybody. Um, uh, if we think about what will, our children will need to be successful, one thing is probably creativity. If the ways we've been trying to solve a problem aren't working, how can we come up with another way of approaching it that nobody else has thought of before? If people are having trouble understanding mindfulness and doing it in the schools, how can we approach them in a completely different way so they can understand its value? Another is flexibility. I was planning to go to someplace else this month, but then I heard about this conference. Do I have the flexibility to change what I was planning, to take advantage of serendipity? Self-control, being able to think before you speak, not put your foot in your mouth, not do something you might regret, resist temptations, etc. And discipline, staying at a task, even though you may be really bored with it by now, it might be really hard, there might be any number of more fun things you'd like to do, but you stay with it and you finish it. Discipline. All of what I've just talked about are executive functions or depend on executive functions. The three core executive functions are inhibitory control, working memory, and cognitive flexibility. Out of those, more higher level executive functions are built, like reasoning, problem solving, and planning. Inhibitory control is the ability to resist a strong inclination to do one thing and instead do what's most appropriate or needed. So one example is to um, inhibit paying attention to other things and pay attention to what you're trying to focus on. That's called selective or focused attention. Another aspect is discipline and staying on task. And a third aspect is self-control. Not doing something impulsively, but instead doing the more considered response. Working memory is, the, is holding information in mind and working with it. And that's critical for anything that unfolds over time. For that always requires holding in mind what happened earlier and relating that to what's happening now whether you're trying to understand a sentence or a paragraph or a novel. Working memory is critical to creativity because creativity involves holding things in mind and disassembling and recombining them in new ways. You need working memory for that. Cognitive flexibility is the ability to be able to think outside the box, the ability to be able to switch perspectives or the focus of attention. An example of poor cognitive flexibility is this. When one door closes, another door opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we don't see the ones which open for us. Executive function skills are critical for school readiness. They're more important than IQ or entry level reading or math. They're also critical for school success throughout the school years. In fact, even in college, discipline accounts for more than twice the variation in grades than does IQ. It's critical for job success, being able to find a job and keep it. It's critical for marital harmony. People with poor executive functions are more difficult to get along with, less dependable, more likely to act on impulse. And poor executive functions lead to all kinds of social problems, like aggression and crime. Children with less self-control, children who are less persistent, more impulsive, and have poor attention regulation, as adults 30 years later, have worse health, earn less, and commit more crimes than those with more self-control as children, controlling for all kinds of different variables. That's based on a study of 1,000 children born in the same city in the same year, followed for 32 years with a 96% retention rate. They concluded, since self-control's effects follow a linear gradient, interventions that achieve even small improvements in self-control for individuals could shift the entire distribution of outcomes in a beneficial direction and yield large improvements in health, wealth, and reduce crime for a nation. What do we want for our children? We want that they should be successful. We want that they should be good people, caring and compassionate. We want that they should be happy. The importance of action for learning, learning through doing. 
The Dalai Lama has said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And that makes sense pretty much to everybody. But he also said, if you want to be happy, practice compassion. And that initially makes no sense to many people. Um, uh, I'd like to suggest that in order to understand that, you need to practice compassion and experience for yourself the joy that it gives you. There's really no other way to understand it. Logically, the statement doesn't make a lot of sense. It's only by seeing for yourself how much happiness it gives you to make others happy that you can understand that. Uh, Rabbi Abraham Heschel said, the act teaches us the meaning of the act. The importance of repeated practice. Prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain I specialize in, is overrated. <laughs> to learn something new, we need prefrontal. But after something is no longer new, the people who perform best usually recruit prefrontal least. So this is an example, I don't know how clearly you can see it, of a very early neuroimaging study. And it, the task we use requires prefrontal cortex, and some people showed activation on both sides of prefrontal, some people more on one side, some people more on the other, and two people, even if this was very visible, don't show activation at all. No prefrontal activation. This is Ruth Brigida, and this is Kathy O'Craven, collaborators on our study. And because they were familiar with the task, prefrontal activation dropped out and averaging them with everybody else, of course, reduced our effect. Um, to learn something, you need prefrontal. After it's no longer new, you're gonna do best usually if you use prefrontal least. Older brain regions that have been around far longer than prefrontal have had much more time to perfect their functioning. They can subserve task performance ever so much more efficiently than can prefrontal. A child may know intellectually at the level of prefrontal that he shouldn't hit another. But in the heat of the moment, if that knowledge hasn't become automatic, passed off from prefrontal to older brain regions, the child's gonna hit another, even though he knows he shouldn't do that. It's the difference between knowing what you should do and having it be second nature, automatic. The only way something becomes automatic, becomes passed off from prefrontal, is through action, repeated action. Nothing else will do. Uh, and Aristotle realized this in the fourth century BC. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. We don't act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have these because we've acted rightly. These virtues are formed in a person by doing the actions. We are what we repeatedly do. If students act as if they are good, they will become good. The way to produce compassionate students is to have them practice compassion day in and day out throughout the day. I would say that you don't become compassionate solely by meditating on compassion. That can be a component, but you need to practice compassion to be compassionate. Children learn what they live. Your humanity is more important than your knowledge or skill or doing the textbook perfect thing. Uh, uh, the British Medical Journal did a survey and people said a good doctor is first and foremost a good human being. Jerome Frank studied all kinds of different psychotherapies and what he finally concluded was it doesn't matter a twit which kind of psychotherapy you're doing. <laughs> what matters is that you have a therapist who exercises a great capacity to love and that's the person who's going to give the best results. Perhaps the most important thing we ever give each other is our attention, especially if it's given from the heart. Listening is the oldest and perhaps the most powerful tool of healing. Diverse activities, including computer games, aerobics, martial arts, yoga, mindfulness, playing a musical instrument, and different school curricula have been shown to improve children's executive functions. Uh, science asked me to do a review of this, and that was published in August. Um, exercise alone appears not to be as effective in improving executive functions as exercise plus character development, like traditional martial arts, 
or exercise plus mindfulness like yoga. Lakes and Hoyt randomly assigned children in grades kindergarten through fifth grade to either Tai Chi martial arts or standard phys ed. For the first three or four months of school, they either did Taekwondo or they did regular phys ed. Besides including physical exercise, each martial arts session began with three questions that emphasized self-monitoring and planning. Where am I? Focus on the present moment. What am I doing? What should I be doing? The latter two questions directed children to select specific behaviors, compare their current behavior to their goal, and prepare concrete plans to improve their behavior. They found that the children assigned to Taekwondo showed greater gains than children in phys ed on all dimensions of executive function study. Cognitive dimensions like being distractible versus focused, affective dimensions like quitting versus staying with something and completing it. This generalized to multiple contexts and was found on multiple measures. Traditional martial arts emphasize self-control, discipline, and character development. And this is the study that Mark referred to last night. In a study with adolescent juvenile delinquents, one group was assigned to traditional Taekwondo, emphasizing things like respect, humility, and honor. And the other group was assigned to modern American martial arts, which emphasized the physical aspect, competition, um, uh, and didn't talk about any of the uh, qualities uh, of character. Those in traditional Taekwondo showed less aggression and anxiety and improved in social ability and self-esteem. Those in modern martial arts showed more juvenile delinquency and aggressiveness and decreased self-esteem and social ability. Whether executive functions are seen depends on the way an activity is done and the amount of time spent doing it, practicing and pushing oneself to do better. Even the best activity for improving executive functions, if done rarely, produces little benefit. Many activities not yet studied might improve executive functions. Almost any activity can be the way in, can be the means for disciplining the mind and enhancing resilience. It all depends on the way the activity is done and the amount of time that's spent doing it. The discipline, the practice produces the benefits. The different parts of the human being are fundamentally interrelated. We're not just intellects, we have emotions, social needs, and bodies. Our brains work better when we're not in a stressed emotional state, and that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. So this is a, a graph showing dopamine levels. Dopamine is a particularly important neurotransmitter in prefrontal. In response to even mild stress, Dopamine uh, levels skyrocket in prefrontal. Dopamine is flooded with prefrontal cortex. It's like flooding your car engine with gasoline. It can't work properly. This is limited to prefrontal. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the brain, even though other regions have dopamine. It's a selective effect on prefrontal cortex and executive functions. Stress impairs your executive functions and will make you look like you have a deficit in executive functions, like ADHD. In college students, one month of stress in preparation for a major exam disrupts prefrontal cortex functional connectivity. You'll be happy to know that it recovers. Stress also impair, impairs selective attention and attention shifting. When we're sad or depressed, we're worse at selective attention. When we're happy, we're better at selective attention. Advice to parents and teachers, relax. You're not perfect. You're not the perfect parent, and that's perfectly okay. You don't need to be perfect, and nobody ever is. And I can guarantee 100% that worrying about whether you're a great parent or a great teacher will not improve your parenting or teaching. It will only make you worse. Stress is not only detrimental to your ability to be a good parent or teacher, your children will pick up on your stress. It will cause them to feel stressed. And if they're stressed, their executive functions will suffer, and thus their performance in school and at work will suffer. We also have social needs. Our brains work better when we're not feeling lonely or socially isolated, 
and that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. So this is one example of a study. They told one group of subjects to expect that they'd have close relationships throughout their lives. They told another group of subjects the opposite. And they told a third group of subjects unrelated bad news. So on memorization questions that don't require prefrontal cortex, everybody performs similarly. But on logical reasoning that requires executive functions, those people told to expect that they'd be lonely perform worse. Other experimenters haven't manipulated this. They simply ask people how they're feeling. And then, for example, they might image them in MRI. And they find that prefrontal cortex works less efficiently in people who say they feel lonely. The school curricula shown to improve executive functions, reduce stress in the classroom, cultivate joy, pride, and self-confidence, and foster social bonding. The most effective way to improve executive functions and academic achievement is probably not to focus narrowly on those alone, but to also address children's emotional and social development, as do all four of the curricula that improve executive functions, and children's physical development, as do aerobics, martial arts, and yoga. For tens of thousands of years, across all cultures, storytelling, dance, art, and play have been part of the human condition. People in all cultures told stories and passed down information by word of mouth, made music, sang, danced, did sports, and played games. There are good reasons why those activities have lasted so long and been found so ubiquitously. They challenge our executive functions, make us happy and proud, address our social needs, and help our bodies develop. What nourishes the human spirit may also be best for executive functions. Thank you.